Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I am very happy and honored to be here today to speak to you about an observational study I'm doing looking at the effects of cannabinoids on seizures in adults with medically refractory epilepsy. What I'm going to do first is go through a little bit of background information, and then I am going to show you some preliminary data which essentially shows the effects that seizures have on autonomic nervous system, and this is coming from a pre-cannabinoid baseline period for my participants. So epilepsy is a central nervous system disorder characterized by abnormal neuronal activity and seizures. Uh, signs and symptoms of seizures include everything from um, a staring spell to convulsions. Seizures also produce autonomic symptoms, so things like pallor and sweating and piloerection. And in fact, um, autonomic changes may be among the most common and least recognized symptoms of seizures. Uh, seizures are typically classified as being either focal or generalized, um, <clears throat> depending on where the abnormal brain activity begins. Focal seizures can also become generalized, um, and people can have multiple types of seizures, <clears throat> and seizures can occur with or without a loss of consciousness. Both focal and generalized seizures can alter autonomic nervous system function, the probable path is through the limbic system, and if there is seizure activation or inhibition of the autonomic network, it can result in effects on all of the systems that you see listed there. So despite the availability of all different kinds of anti-epileptic drugs, for about 30% of people with epilepsy, their seizures are not well controlled. Uh, this is a condition that's called medically refractory epilepsy, and it's associated with severe morbidity and also increased mortality in the form of a condition that's called SUDEP, which stands for Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. So um, this gap in treatment that exists is what has led people to seek alternatives such as cannabinoids, um, the endocannabinoid system makes sense both as a potential site of impairment in epilepsy and also as a potential target for treatment in epilepsy, and that has mainly to do with its role in the regulation of synaptic activity and also homeostasis. So we have um, all different types of studies using a whole variety of different types of cannabinoids which point to the potential usefulness of cannabinoids as a treatment for epilepsy, including uh, the two recent randomized control trials which showed that uh, Epidiolex was effective in decreasing seizure frequency in children with two really severe forms of epilepsy. Um, and so we have many studies that have pointed to cannabinoids as being potentially useful in um, epilepsy, and the types of cannabinoids being used are CBD, combinations of CBD and THC, and even whole plant products. Unfortunately, uh, recommendations about the specific uh, cannabinoid types and dosing and routes of administration, etc., uh, et are um, lacking, particularly for adults. And so um, not everybody has a Dr. Goldstein available to them, unfortunately. Um, and so adults are basically sort of taking their treatments into their own hands. So that leads me to my study. Uh, the study that I'm doing is an observational study of the effects of cannabinoids on seizures in adults with medically refractory epilepsy. It has a um, within subjects design where we are following um, participants for one month prior to their uh, initiating the use of cannabinoids and then for five months after they begin using cannabinoids. And I have to note, though, that uh, no cannabinoids are provided to the participants of this study uh, by the researchers, and that's because it's an observational study. Legally, the only thing I can do is um, observe what these people are doing to treat themselves. In fact, um, participants' uh, support for medicinal cannabis use is provided by the realm of caring, and you will be hearing from Heather Jackson in just a few minutes. So the main objectives I have for this study are to characterize the effects of cannabinoids on seizures in adults with medically refractory epilepsy, 
using both physiological and behavioral measures. Uh, but I also have a very important second objective, which is basically to enhance our understanding of medically refractory epilepsy in general, as well as the effects of uh, cannabinoid use through the daily wireless uh, recording of participants' autonomic physiology using a um, device called the E4 wristband, which is produced by the company Empatica. Uh, the main outcome measures I have for this study are seizure frequency, quality of life, and I also um, have a particular interest and in hypothesis around electrodermal activity. Uh, here are the inclusion and exclusion criteria for my study. Um, they are pretty standard for people with medically refractory epilepsy. Um, the highlight by the Colorado resident is uh, there because I recently received IRB approval to extend the study uh, to people who are residing in states where cannabis is legal for the treatment of epilepsy. Um, the main thing that we are looking for is uh, that people have not used cannabinoids within the last month. So over the six months course of the study, participants make three visits to the lab or I make three visits to their home. And at each of these visits, participants uh, fill out a whole battery of uh, standardized questionnaires and they also provide us with urine samples. And then about a month after visit one, participants are free to begin using cannabinoids. So here is a list of the behavioral questionnaires that we uh, give to people at each of those visits. And here's a list of the cannabinoids and metabolites that are being tested for in participants' urine. And that brings me finally to um, the E4 wristband. The E4 is the device that we are using for daily wireless physiological recording. It was um, made or developed by Rosalind Picard and her colleagues at the Media Lab at MIT. And it records a whole bunch of different uh, autonomic variables, which you see listed here. It also includes um, an event marker. And participants in this study are instructed to press the event marker once if they have a seizure, if they're able, and then twice when they use uh, cannabinoids. And I have, again, the electrodermal activity highlighted there because that's a variable that's of particular interest to me. Electrodermal activity is basically sweating activity that's elicited by activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So in addition to uh, developing the E4, Dr. Picard and her group also developed an algorithm for seizure detection that's based on the variables that the E4 collects. And they published a study um, where they found, for example, that electrodermal activity plus motion is better than motion alone uh, for automated grand mal uh, uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizure detection. And in fact, um, Empatica is actually producing seizure reports for this study. So um, this group has also made a number of other important contributions. So for example, in a case study, they demonstrated that um, a signature of a GTCS seizure in EEG was associated um, with a spike in electrodermal activity that's measured at the wrist. They have also done some other work which essentially points to um, autonomic dysfunction as being um, a potential contributing factor to SUDEP. So um, I've had a whole number of people contact me um, that are interested in participating in the study. Many of them have had to be um, excluded or not enrolled because they don't meet the study criteria. Um, currently, I have four participants enrolled in the study, and here is some background information on those participants. Uh, so four are male and one is female. All four of the participants have um, focal complex seizures. For three of these participants, those can progress to GTCS seizures, um, and two of these participants actually have VNS. 
I, I wish I could share more about the participants in the study because they are really truly amazing people. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, show you some data from each of these four participants. Um, and the first two participants I'm going to show you are actually under the care of the epileptologist on my research team. His name is Dr. Doshi. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you that data, some of which he is reviewing with me as well. So um, first up is participant 1580. What you're looking at here is an E4 recording that lasts for approximately 16 hours. Um, the top trace is electrodermal activity, followed by blood volume pulse, motion acceleration, heart rate, and then temperature. Um, there are a number of things that I want to point out to you on this slide. So first is that at about 4.30 p.m. on this day, um, Empatica detects a seizure. And you can see that autonomically this is associated with a spike in movement activity as well as a spike or some erratic heart activity. Um, next, what you can see is that there is a red line through the data, and this indicates that a caregiver um, pressed the event marker, indicating that they also um, identified the seizure. So following those spikes in activity, you see sort of a quiet period, which is likely a recovery period. And then about 6.30 p.m. or so, the participant seems to kind of resume their normal daily activities. Um, until about 9 p.m., uh, what you see in the data there that's circled is an artifact. That's due to the participant taking off his E4 and leaving it on. He ultimately puts it back on, and it looks like he probably goes to sleep maybe around 10.30 p.m. And so um, it turns out that these event markers are really incredibly important for the research. And that's because it allows me, one, to verify the seizure that was detected by Empatica. Uh, it also allows me to see what's going on autonomically for the person when they have a seizure. And it also gives me a little bit of insight into what the algorithm developed by Empatica might be picking up on. Uh, what's unfortunate is that um, I don't often see many of these marks in the data, and that's because uh, most of my participants are not aware of when they've had a seizure, and caregivers can't necessarily catch everything. Here's a file from that same participant. This particular file lasts about 42 hours long, and you can see that right about 1 o'clock in the morning, Empatica detected a seizure. Again, it seems to have that um, pattern where there's a spike in the movement activity as well as a spike in the heart activity. This particular seizure was also marked by a caregiver. And again, after the seizure, you can see sort of that, that quiet potential recovery period. Um, and then Empatica also detected two additional seizures. And for those seizures, the pattern is not quite as clear as the pattern in, in some of the previous um, files that I've shown you, and neither of these was marked by a caregiver. Um, just for context, what you're looking at here is a plot of the mean and the median electrodermal values um, across all of the recordings that I have for this participant, at least at the time I made the presentation. Overlaid with this are those orange circles, and those are indications of a caregiver pressing the invent marker to mark for a seizure. The two that are circled are the two that I showed um, in the previous files. Unfortunately, at this point, I'm not really seeing anything consistent in terms of the relationship between electrodermal activity and uh, seizure activity. Next up is participant 148E. He is a 28-year-old man. Uh, the recording that you're looking at is about 26 hours long, and it's pretty unremarkable until the very end when a seizure was detected and was also reported by the caregiver. Um, what's unfortunate is that um, when the caregiver detected the seizure, she pressed the event marker so hard that she actually turned off the, um, the wristband. <laughs> so that's just the nature of working with uh, human subjects. And so here what you're seeing is a blow up of the last two hours of that recording so you can see what's going on autonomically a little bit more clearly. Um, so again, you see a spike in the movement activity. You can also see a spike in the heart rate. And in this particular case, you can see a little bit of a dip in temperature and a uh, peak in the electrodermal activity. Uh, Next, um, you're looking at the data from the same participant. Um, and in this participant, um, you can see that around 8 p.m., um, Empatica detected a seizure. 
Um, <clears throat> sorry, this minutes. is a new new participant. This is a 34-year-old female. I should have mentioned that. So this is her file. It's about 24 hours long. And again, at about 8 p.m., um, Empatica detected a seizure. Subsequently, the seizure was also reported by the caregiver. In this particular case, uh, the data does not fit necessarily the pattern that I showed you previously. This might be the case because this particular person has more of an absence-type seizure than a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Here's a file from her, and in this case, uh, the caregiver reported the seizure, but nothing was detected by Empatica. And then, again, for context, you're looking at the mean and median electrodermal values over all of the recordings that I have for this person. Uh, the asterisks are marking the time frames when seizures were detected, and the two that uh, are circled are the ones that I showed you, one where Empatica did detect and one where they did not. Uh, you can also see other tags in the data, which are these blue circles, and those tags are indicative of time frames um, when the person is taking CBD. So they have moved out of their baseline period into the time frame where they're taking CBD. This is going to be extremely useful, both in the short and the long term, to help us see how um, CBD is affecting um, people autonomically and also affecting seizures. And then last but not least, this is participant 1194. He's a 42-year-old male. Uh, the recording you're looking at is about 27 hours long. Uh, during this time frame, Empatica detected two seizures. Uh, the second seizure in particular seems really close in pattern to some of the seizures I showed you previously. Um, the first one looks similar as well. It just happens to occur, uh, that, that recovery period ha happens to occur during a time frame the person would normally be asleep. And so I can tell you that um, Empatica has reported um, many more seizures than um, are being marked by these participants. Um, <clears throat> and so it may well be that they're having more seizures than uh, the participants or their caregivers are aware of. But one of the things I'm doing is working with uh, Dr. Doshi and Empatica to make sure that our seizure verif verification is as accurate as possible. What we hope to learn is, overarching what we hope to learn is whether cannabinoid use is beneficial for adults with MRE. We also want to learn whether it affects seizure frequency by looking at those three things that you see here, and also quality of life. I have a particular interest in EDA and temperature. Moving forward with the next 30 participants, um, what I'm going to do to address some of these issues is, when possible, verify the seizures using video EEG. I'm also going to send some control data through Empatica to get a report on the false positives and try to motivate caregivers to keep really consistent, detailed seizure records and connect more frequently with participants and caregivers. Thank Let's you. give it up for Robert Beck.